take your eyes off them, not even for a second. For my next demo, I'm going to need some magic change, color change, color change, color change, color change. Next demonstration, I'm going to need a volunteer. Everybody ready? Chemistry's awesome. It's time for fire. Welcome to the Carleton University Chemistry Magic Show. To the 15th annual Carleton University Chemistry Magic Show. Okay, can we get the uh, lights back up? Okay, so my name is Jeff Manthorpe. I'm a professor here in the department. And on my left is uh, one of our staff members, Aaron McConnell, who uh, some of you in the audience here uh, in the room may have uh, met at lunch. Um, I wasn't there, I was out to lunch. Um, don't worry, there'll be more good jokes like that later. Um, <laughs> now, one of the things we wanna talk about today in addition to you know, having some fun demonstrations, are some of the important chemical principles underlying uh, uh, chemical processes. And one of them, when it comes to reactions of solids, involves surface area. OK, so stop and think about it. It actually kind of makes sense that, you know, if you're going to do a reaction on the surface of a solid, the area of the solid is probably important, right? So here I've got a very finely powdered solid called lyco lycopodium. That's L-Y-C-O, not like a podium. Right? And So that's actually just charring on my hand, and I've got enough of a pile there that it's only now getting hot. <laughs> um, and you can see it just charred, right? It didn't really burn, OK? But when I had some in the tube and I blew it out, the surface area of the particles was much higher. The exposed surface area was much higher, right? And so it was able to interact with air and therefore get oxygen and actually burn and burn much faster, much more cleanly, right? So you want to see that again? Yeah. yeah, OK. We know why you're here. You want us to do stuff, burn, blow up, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. OK. So if Sarah can get the lights for us, we'll do this one more time. The impact of surface area on the rate of a chemical reaction. All right. And that's why we get the smoke alarms turned off. <laughs> okay, Erin, what have you got for us? Great, yeah, so you can turn the lights back on, Sarah. All right, so all of you got to see uh, Peter upstairs in the lab, right? And we were playing with some dry ice. So he told you um, about the dry ice and about how it is not water. It's a different chemical. It's carbon dioxide, right? Uh, and it's frozen, and it gives off this gas. So we're moving it from hand to hand so we don't freeze ourselves. We can also do cool things with it. We can take advantage of the fact that it's carbon dioxide to dissolve in water and change the properties of the solution. So uh, most of you are in grade 11, so you may have done some titrations, acid-base titrations in class. Uh, or if you're in grade 12, you may have done those. And so basically, an acidic solution is something like uh, lime juice, lemon juice, orange juice, those like very kind of like tangy things. Uh, and then a basic thing is like a soap, laundry detergent, things like that. Okay, so we're going to change the pH. And in these um, graduated cylinders, there's something called a pH indicator. It's just a color change. So it's one way for chemists to monitor reactions uh, is to use these different pHs. So we're going to drop some in and see what happens. So that one you'll see very sharply transitioned from pink to yellow. This one goes from blue, dark blue, to kind of like an orangey green. So that one goes from yellow to orange. It's a little bit harder to see. 
This one is one you may be familiar with in a thaline if you've done any sort of titration. So that one goes from pink to clear. And then this one is a special type of indicator. It's called a universal indicator. So if you have like universal earbuds or remotes, you know how that works. It basically works for anything across any brand type thing. Um, so universal indicator has a mix of indicators and it's going to tell us pH from very low to very high. Uh, and so you'll see this one go through a few different transitions. So it starts out blue, it's moving towards green, yellow, and then at its most acidic, it's going to become red, similar to this color. And you can see it getting there now. So you'll also notice that something is happening here, right? So this is more significant than what you would have seen when you were just kind of holding it in your hand. Uh, and so this is the CO2. It's heavier than the air we breathe, though. So it's sinking. So this is why you see it coming over and um, going down. And so keep that property in mind. We're going to come back to that later. Um, but we'll send over to you, Jeff. OK. So the timing of this show is somewhat deliberate, right? We wanted a bit of a holiday theme. But let's back up a little bit to a holiday. I guess we can call it a holiday. Um, certainly a popular day on the calendar. Uh, Halloween, right? So um, has anybody ever seen a Halloween reaction before? No? OK, so if it's a Halloween reaction, I mean, obviously, what colors are we going for, right? Orange or black, right? Yeah, OK, green, I have three purple. colorless solutions here. Here are some of those. But mm -hmm. we're going orange and black. I said green and purple are Halloween, too, but we're going orange and black. Yeah. OK. So pay attention. Orange. Black. There we go. OK. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, no. The orange color is actually mercury 2 iodide. Uh, oh, good. You know some chemistry. Great. <laughs> yeah. That's a bad idea, right? Um, the other thing that's in there is uh, the, uh, the black color is actually a really dark blue. It's starch iodide complex. Uh, that, uh, see some uh, applications in different areas of chemistry as well as, uh, as biology. Uh, so that's how we get those two colors. And I will definitely not be drinking that. <laughs> Please don't. It'll yeah. end the show real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. So remember I told you to keep this in mind. It's heavier than air. And so Sarah, if you want to hit the lights, what we're going to do is use this gas to extinguish the flame. And so in uh, fire extinguishers, you may or maybe don't know that there's multiple different types of extinguishers for different types of fire. So this is a type of fire that we can extinguish using CO2 because we're getting rid or we're displacing the oxygen. There's other types of fires. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit later in a different demo. But for this one, we're going to take the CO2 that's accumulated in the cooler while it, the dry ice has just been sitting here and use it to extinguish. So this is why we told you earlier not to eat it, whoever had the dry ice, because you put that in your mouth and then there goes your oxygen. So that's a quick demo. We can get the lights back on. Um, but it's very effective. It also shows why you have these sorts of monitors in your house. You want to make sure that that gas isn't um, becoming to a level where it can be toxic for you. So the next demo we're going to do, you've probably seen if you have access to um, uh, YouTube or TikTok, I'm sure you've seen elephant's toothpaste before. So we're going to do a smaller version. Don't worry, we're not going to be filling up this whole room as much as I would like to. Uh, but it's quite messy, and um, they'll kick us out of here. So we're going to do a small one to show you the chemistry. So all of those huge reactions are likely working with yeast. So yeast is a way you can do this at home. Um, you can activate the yeast, put it in some warm water, and then you can react it with hydrogen peroxide, which uh, you may recognize as like something from your first aid kit, or if you've bleached your hair, um, it also can go into that sort of thing as well. So we're using, instead of yeast, a chemical um, catalyst called potassium iodide. So it's going to transfer the hydrogen peroxide, so the H2O2, in this solution into water and produce gas as well as a byproduct. So we're going to add this in here. So it's just a fine white powder. And we just need a little bit of it. 
Then we're going to add soap to the reaction. Can anyone, does anyone have a guess of what the soap might be doing in the elephant's toothpaste? It's super important that you add it. Yeah. It makes bubbles, exactly. It's trapping the gas that's going to come up from the reaction. So you can do elephant's toothpaste without the soap. It's quite boring. It just kind of splashes and then it's done. Uh, so we're going to cover our potassium iodide. And then I like to add a little bit of color. That way you can kind of see the way that the reaction swirls out of the tube, just for fun. Um, so we'll put in some red and some blue. And the color doesn't do anything in the reaction. Um, so if you're doing it at home, you can make it whatever color you want. OK, so then we're going to add our hydrogen peroxide. So one thing I will also say, our Ki, our uh, catalyst is stronger, and our hydrogen peroxide is stronger. So um, the reaction will be a little bit faster. All right, so we'll move our reagents out of the way. And we're going to add this and get ready. So you'll see, <laughs> it's more beautiful this way, that the, you can see steam coming off. You can see that the gas got trapped in the soap. So this is why we have all these bubbles. Um, and you'll also maybe guess what's coming off. Like what is the, the, the steam or the gas or whatever we can see coming off? You have any guesses from that, from the reaction? Sorry? So there is gas in there. In this case, it's just water vapor. So it's just, yeah, it's oxygen gas, it's hydrogen gas coming out of that reaction. And we're seeing also the water boil, basically. Yeah, so excellent. So we're just going to move, move that. Jeff, we'll send it over there while, you, uh, while I get cleaned up. OK, speaking of making a mess, here's a classic one. Let's make some slime. So in this beaker here, I have just a solution of a polymer. Uh, called polyvinyl alcohol, okay? And so uh, polyvinyl alcohol, also known as PVA, you may uh, know from, uh, or you may have encountered it in uh, dishwasher or detergent pods. Um, so the, the coating on those is actually polyvinyl alcohol. And so clearly it you know, melts and dissolves in hot water, okay? And uh, it's... Uh, Toxicity is quite low, so we don't really have to worry too much about it in low concentrations. Um, but these molecules, polymers are extremely long molecules, right? And they tend to be very floppy. So in order to get some rigidity out of them, like in plastics, right, these are all polymers, what we have to do is we have to cross-link them. So we have to get the chains to actually interact with each other. And so uh, in cases like uh, hard plastics, like tables and things like that, it tends to be a, an absolute chemical bonding cross-linking, uh, a covalent cross-linking. And in this case here, what we're going to do is more of an ionic uh, interaction, so almost like a, a hydrogen bonding salt formation type scenario. Um, and so what I'm going to use as our cross-linking agent is borax in water. Okay, so pour some of that in. And you can see that what was just a simple solution is now getting a little more viscous. Reminds me of the last time I had a cold. Which, thanks to my kids, was about four times since school started. Let's see, it's getting pretty stiff. All right, let's get this out of here. Here we go. So in this case, I used about the longest polyvinyl alcohol that you can buy. So it's really thick and very much a gel, a very stiff gel. And so if I leave that for a few minutes, it'll get 
really, really stiff. And I wish we had a sink in here. <laughs> <laughs> we have this was help. a bad idea. <laughs> All right, well, you fight with that. I'm sure many of you have made slime at home. Um, you can also make slime at home with white glue and contact lens solution. Make sure it has boric acid in it. Um, so it'll say some percentage of boric acid because the borate is the crosslinker. Uh, and so you can do that. You can also buy like slime activator. It's all in there. Uh, okay, so the next demo we're gonna do is a very small fire, um, but it comes from sodium. So you've probably heard of sodium through like sodium chloride. Does anyone know what sodium chloride is most commonly? Salt, yeah, so like table salt. Uh, we have different types of salts. If anyone's been in the hospital and you've had an IV, you'll have some sodium chloride pumped into you. So we have a few different examples, right? Um, so that is when sodium is charged and it's interacting with the chloride chloride ion that's also charged, right? So we have uh, this electrostatic interaction like Jeff was kind of talking about earlier. In this case, we have elemental sodium. Um, and so it is just sodium. So we're going to take it out. Right now, it's stored in um, a solution. It's, it, it's actually an oil. It's not a water. Uh, and this is why I was saying it's important that we know um, what type of chemicals are in our labs. Uh, because some of them are highly reactive with water. This is an example. So this sodium metal is really soft, actually. Like you can see, uh, I just stabbed it. And we're going to just cut right through it, actually. Uh, and so I'm going to just take a piece here. So if you like to watch these sorts of demos on um, YouTube or TikTok, you've probably seen someone throw like a massive chunk into water off a bridge. If you've seen this, it's highly irresponsible. Don't do that. Um, so we're going to, oops, <laughs> almost did it. We're going to put this chunk back into the container before we get any water involved. Um, and we're going to see why this reaction happens, OK? So first of all, we need to make sure that the, you can see now that it's cut, it's actually quite shiny. Yeah, you can see it there. And it's also, it's very soft. Again, we cut through it, you can make it, it's malleable with your hands. We need to make sure the oil is dried off really, really well. Um, because if the oil is still on it, the reaction won't be as exciting. Okay, so this is water. It has an indicator in it. So we're gonna experience a pH change. The pH change is gonna come um, with the interaction of sodium. And does anyone have any guesses? If we have water in here, so we have hydroxide uh, ions and we have so H plus, OH minus, any guesses what we might get if we throw sodium in there? Excellent. So we're watching for an acidic to basic change, OK? So you can see very slowly in here, this reaction. Probably still has a little bit of oil on it. We keep watching it. Oh. Mistakes were made. So we'll throw in another piece here and you'll see. So the fizz you can hear is gas. It's producing gas. Oh, is it gonna light for us? There we go. Don't want to shoot firecrackers at you guys. <laughs> Where's the distilled water? Oh, it's on the ground there. We'll just pour some in. We don't want to leave unreacted sodium. That would be bad news bears. Get some on this side. There we go. No, I think it's done. I think it's done. That was the slowest, most boring sodium in water I've Name. ever seen. Let's put in a bigger piece. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it catches fire and we see like sometimes um, I'm not saying it I'm not saying it was this guy, but I'm not saying it wasn't this guy who uh, burnt the ceiling. So we don't want to go we don't want to go that far. No, 
she's not doing the whole chunk. <laughs> Part of the problem too is the water is reacting with the sodium making sodium hydroxide. The sodium hydroxide is not reactive. So we're decreasing the amount of reagents which can react when we add more and more without adding more water. There we go. Yeah, now we have some fire. Excellent. Woo! There we go. So that one's done. <laughs> okay. All right. Do you want to do the octopical? Sure. Okay. So you may have noticed um, the color that we got there uh, was that yellowy orange color, right? That's actually distinctive for sodium. So I can show you that in another way. Right? So this is a legit pickle, okay? And now we're going to electrocute it. Why not? Yeah. So the reason that it starts giving off uh, that yellowy orange light, which is, as I said, distinctive for sodium, uh, is that the electrons in the sodium ion are becoming excited. And then when they relax, they give off that light. So anytime we excite a sodium ion, it, uh, it gives off that same color. Okay. Now, I can't read that. Okay. Okay. Also, this one's a little bit smelly. Not in a delicious way. In a how you imagine burned pickle would smell. So we can do this and make street lights. We go through more pickles that way. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can take sodium vapor and, and make lights, right? That's what we see with fluorescent lighting. Um, and it gets a little brighter as I turn up the voltage. All right, and our bulb is now burnt out. All right, so can I eat the pickle? I, in theory, I could. I hate pickles. That won't stop him. But well, don't eat that one. I'm not going to eat this one because it's a little rusty now. Um, but here's the one we zapped at the last show. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> oh, things you do for science. Oh. You're here. Okay, speaking of sodium and other things we can do with it. Okay, so let's go from pickles. Okay, we're, we're just changing flavors now. We're going from dill pickle to salt and vinegar. So, if you like salt and vinegar chips, um, Great, I'm there with you. But, let's face it, putting vinegar on potato chips seems like a bad idea, right? One of the things you like about potato chips is the, the crispy texture, right? So, if you were to soak them in vinegar, eh, it kind of disappears, right? So, what we need is something that gives us the salty flavor and the sort of acidic flavor that comes with vinegar. Right? So that comes from acetic acid, but it's actually not the acid part. It's actually the conjugate base part of it. So the acetate ion that gives us that, um, that vinegar flavor. So if we take sodium acetate, the salt, we can put that on chips. It's dry and you, you retain the, the crispiness of the chips. Okay. So, um, What I have in here is sodium acetate. And you're thinking, uh, if that's a salt, why is it a liquid? That's kind of weird for a salt. Okay? And that's true. Most salts are solids. So this is sodium acetate with a little bit of water in there. And just enough to get this to dissolve at high temperature. Now, the interesting thing is when you cool it down, 
it doesn't precipitate back out. Because sodium acetate is a chemical that actually exhibits what's called supersaturation. So now if I add the tiniest bit more sodium acetate to this, it's all coming right back out. And here, touch the bottom. Yeah, it's warm, just comfortably warm, right? Yeah. So that precipitation is actually an exothermic process. So it's giving off energy, right? And so we can use tricks like this uh, to make hot and cold packs. So some salts actually give off heat as they dissolve. This one actually gives off heat as it comes out of solution, so you could use that to make a hot pack. Salts of ammonia, so ammonium salts, actually their dissolution is actually endothermic, so you could crack them up, open in a pack and you actually have a cold pack, okay? Now, another trick we can do with that is we can actually kind of make a tower, almost like a, a stalagmite in a cave, where as I, if I pour it out, it, um, it actually crystallizes faster than it would run down the side. So I can just pour it and it will actually form up a big tower. You could do a similar sort, it's not exactly the same chemistry, but a similar sort of effect if you put a bottle of Gatorade in the freezer and you get it to just the right cold temperature before it starts to crystallize and freeze. When you open it, just the force of opening it will cause it to freeze and you'll see the whole freeze through the bottle. Mm -hmm. So it's a fun thing you can try at home if you have a Gabe bottle of Gatorade. Another polymer uh, demonstration. Periodic, periodic Here, a little bit of water. Okay. Okay. So where's the water? This one? Okay. Well, let's see. It's cheating. It's totally cheating. The question is, how did I cheat? Right? So what I did was I actually put in there a polymer called, uh, that's a, actually what's called a super absorbent polymer. So the, this actually what's, it's a very hydrophilic polymer, so it loves water. Right? So just put some of that in there. If you like IUPAC, it's sodium polyacrylate. Anybody think of a of an application for that? I guarantee you nobody developed this just for fun. Hmm? Cool party trick. Cool party trick. Yeah, all <laughs> these are the cool best party tricks. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Diapers. Right? So hydrophilic polymers get used in diapers, and you can see that they gel out very quickly. And apparently this stuff also gets used for fake snow. Yeah. In, movie and TVs, uh, TV shows. Okay, what's up? Great, yeah, speaking of TV shows. Um, so if any of you uh, have Netflix and maybe have watched um, Chernobyl, the show, or maybe you've heard of radioactivity, maybe you've had a medical test. Uh, so radioactivity is a property of chemicals or molecules. Uh, in this case, we have one 
that is very, very slightly radioactive. It's not harmful to you, it's not harmful to me, uh, but we're gonna be able to get a reading off of it. And so some ways that we measure chemical reactions are things we can observe, so we can hear gas evolving, we can see flame, um, we can smell things happening, we can see color changes. In this case, to see the properties of this molecule, we need to use an instrument called a Geiger counter. We learned this morning that the Geiger counter was invented in 1908, so that's a cool fun fact. Uh, and the way that this thing works is it detects something called alpha particles. And so you'll hear it just kind of ticking. That's the baseline sound just in the environment. We're kind of in a concrete box, so you don't really hear too much sound. Um, but when we bring it closer to this chemical, you'll hear an increase in the sound. Can you hear the ticking? Yeah? So now this is in a sealed container. So the container's keeping us safe. You can hear it if you're close. The further away we go, we don't hear it. So it's not affecting me here. But if we take the lid off of this, and we expose the surface of the detector almost directly to the chemical, listen to the difference in sound. You can see the needle too. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Now our computer's telling us when radioactivity is around. So I'll do that again. So we use radioactivity in chemistry, not as much anymore. Um, so in some instances, we use it to label things like DNA. Uh, there's a whole field of radiochemistry that is interesting and still ongoing. It's just less common. So you need to be more specialized expert to be working with it now. Uh, and so that is a cool demonstration um, just of one property of a molecule that we can't see, but we can use tools to amplify that, uh, this Geiger counter, and we can hear that sound. So I think we're back. Okay. All right. Now, I warned you this was a holiday theme show. So now we're going to get to more of the current holiday season, I suppose, um, for at least a portion of the population. Um, so some of the traditional colors of Christmas. How about silver? But that's not silver. That's mercury. Once again, cheers. Um, okay, and how about red? So this is a dye called Sudan 3. Okay, and here I have a colored salt, so this is nickel chloride in water. And now you can see I have three layers there. And that's not an accident. So these three layers are not miscible with each other. So I can take this. And the Sudan 3 was not dissolved in water. It was dissolved in an oil-based solvent. And so now this is going to separate out. And you can see already there's the mercury on the bottom, the Sudan 3 on top, and in the middle, slowly separating out now is the nickel chloride layer. There's a suspension of some of the um, uh, Sudan 3 in, in toluene, the organic solvent, uh, mixed in with it. So that's why the green color isn't quite as potent as when we started. But give it a minute and it becomes much more visible. Okay. So there's our Christmas demo. Three layers. Brought to you by salad dressing. Uh, which is <laughs> the same phenomenon. Right? Oil and water, not mixing. Okay, where are we now? Okay, liquid nitrogen. Okay. So earlier, uh, if you were on the tour, you may have seen some liquid nitrogen demos. Uh, so we're gonna do some more liquid nitrogen stuff. So I, I guess we're kind of like ice and fire over here because Jeff is always setting things on fire and my stuff is always really cold. Um, so you can see the liquid nitrogen I'm pouring in here. You can see that it's 
bubbly that it's giving off gas, so that's the nitrogen uh, as in different forms, right? Relative to the room that we're in, the nitrogen is boiling. It's, it's very cold, like we're very hot compared to the temperature that it likes to be at. Uh, the liquid nitrogen itself is at minus 196, so almost minus 200 degrees Celsius. Um, and so what we're going to do is kind of use lettuce as a model of like a living system in the sense that it is full of water. And people always want to know what would happen if you freeze X, Y, Z that is living in liquid nitrogen. So we're going to take a look. So we have lettuce. We know that it's full of water, right? We can see those veins um, that are carrying water throughout the plant. <laughs> And so we're going to dip it in the liquid nitrogen and we're going to see what happens to it. Okay? So you can hear, again, the boiling. So what do you think is going to happen with this lettuce? Any uh, hypotheses? What do you think? So it becomes very brittle. Right? We can just break it, can break it up in my hands. It becomes very, very brittle. So if we're thinking about, Jeff come, becomes less brittle when he sticks his hand in there because it's evaporating very quickly. Um, and he is very hot compared to this. So, <laughs> chaos. Uh, <laughs> so we have that. Another fun thing to do is to kind of see, like, maybe if we are, like, a little bit more gentle. Uh, it won't be so brittle. It won't destroy it. Let's see. So we'll just freeze this guy and we'll leave it sitting there for a few minutes. And while we do that, well, we can talk about what happens to gases when gases get cold. So if we have a closed container, which is going to be a balloon, and we have gas inside it, so it's just my breath, it's no, nothing pure. Um, what do you think is going to happen when we put this in a colder environment? Yeah, exactly. So it's going to shrink. So let's test that out. Should, should we bring it to the overhead camera again? Okay. Shove this in here. And you, can, you can hear. Can we see yet? Not yet. Oh, there we go. You can see that it is significantly shrinking in size, right? So let's see how many we can put in. That's two. All right, we have more in here. I have limited lung capacity, so there's only four. Spoiler alert. But we'll see if we can get them all in there. Has anyone seen the demo at the Science and Tech? You said they had how many balloons go into? Oh, they had a container of similar size, and I think they put about 10 or 12 balloons in. Yeah, we could be here all day, quite frankly. So we're going to get them all in there, nice and frozen. Good. We also have some different sized ones. So do we have any hypotheses about? a different sized container. What might happen with these? Any idea? You all think it's going to shrink the same? All right, let's put her in. OK. So now, logically, what do we think will happen when we take the balloons back out? Yeah, they'll expand, right? So I will give you a warning. Some people hate popping balloons. Sometimes they pop. So just a heads up. Is that all of them? Yeah. Yep. You'll notice too on the camera, you'll see the liquid nitrogen like zooming around. Oh, I froze my glove. I forgot I had gloves on. There we go. See, it beads up. So if you were upstairs and Peter put the liquid nitrogen on the floor and it came zooming towards you, it likes to pick up dust. So you see these little dust bunnies float by. Kind of funny. It's a great way to sweep the floor. Yeah. Great, so we recovered them all. So that's exciting. Well, we shouldn't speak too soon. Do you see the 
nitrogen gas coming off there as well. Expediting the process with my <laughs> heat from my hands. So the question is always like, what would happen if you put a human in liquid nitrogen? Um, and so you wouldn't shatter like this. You would sustain severe frostbite. Uh, if you were completely submerged, you wouldn't make it. You would just be a human popsicle. It's like quite the extreme polar bear dip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. OK. So you're on your um, banana now. OK. Before we do that, here's one of my favorite demonstrations because it allows me to get my frustrations out. <laughs> um, did you guys notice? It blew before. Ah, yeah, paying attention. Very nice. OK. So what's in here is a dye called methylene blue. OK. And if you have you guys learned about redox, oxidation and reduction? Mm -hmm. So you've seen oxidation so. happening, right? It's, you know, you take iron and expose it to air, and it starts to rust, right? That's an oxidation process. Reduction is the opposite process. OK, so if we want to make sodium metal, we take sodium chloride and run electricity through it to reduce it to sodium metal. OK, also conveniently allows us to make chlorine gas. Um, now, what I put in here was glucose and potassium hydroxide, which is actually a reducing agent. OK, and it reduced the dye from a blue form to a colorless form. And now I can oxidize it back by just shaking it. So how would shaking cause an oxidation reaction, you think? Hint, run with the name. <laughs> oxidation. Oxygen inside the flask. So you shake it up, and it mixes. But there's still reducing agent in the water that's in there. Sometimes people will put this in a fish tank to um, make it look really blue. Not particularly good for the fish, by the way. No. Um, but this uh, has also been used as a medication for uh, humans in various ways and also uh, led to the development of a lot of different medications, including things like anti-malarials and antipsychotics. So um, this is what led to the development of Thorazine, better known as horse tranquilizer. Um, not the same as ketamine. Not the same as ketamine, no. No. OK. So why don't we go back to sodium for a minute um, and make ourselves a candle. I think you, the lights are off for the rest now. Yeah, OK. So Sarah, yeah, if you can get the lights for us. OK. This one falls under the category of you can try this at home. Just don't burn the house down. <laughs> okay, but you can impress your friends and freak out your family. So here's my candle. Mm. It's the best candle I've eaten all day. <laughs> That's saying something. Mm -hmm. So, what's the trick? This isn't a candle. It's a banana. So if you want to do this at home, I recommend getting a really waxy old candlestick and putting the banana on that. And then you get the flame by taking a, a nut. I recommend a pecan, or if you're snooty, a pecan. <laughs> um, and nuts contain a lot of oil. Oils burn. This one is also smelly. You don't need a blowtorch for this, by the way. Um, you can do it with a regular barbecue lighter, and it will light, just takes a little longer, but this is only supposed to be a one hour show. <laughs> so um, yeah, it'll burn for several minutes. There's plenty of oil there. And then yeah, if you do it in the dark. You know, and you can buy roasted nuts. Yeah. 
there's enough moisture in the banana that you, if you do it right, you shouldn't really burn your tongue. Okay? But be forewarned. Occupational hazard. Yeah. Okay. Great. So and now, now, back to the dark? Yeah. We're in the dark for the rest now, Sarah. Okay. All right. Anybody have a black light or a UV flashlight or anything at home? I recommend picking one up because it's a lot of fun. Okay. So what I got here, just some plain old liquid laundry detergent. So that actually contains a chemical called umbelliferone. And this is how you get your whites whiter and your colors brighter. So small amounts of this actually stay on the clothing, okay? And uh, white clothing, as it ages, yellows. And so if you put on something, something in there um, on the clothing that actually uh, under uh, UV light will fluoresce in a blue color, it counteracts the yellowing effect. Okay, it also uh, allows colors to appear brighter than their, you know, your brain's processing it and it's like, that's brighter than it should be. What the heck? That's what's going on. Okay, it's this umbelliferone that's fluorescing with just ambient UV light, particularly if you're outside. Okay, so that's one trick you can also try at home. Um, what else do we want to try? I'll do the highlighter. Okay. Okay, so here's something else you may recognize from home. You see these? Yeah, we hear glow sticks or not glow sticks. Let me turn it so you can see the label. Yeah, they're highlighters, right? So they're called, if you read the fine print on the package, they're called fluorescent highlighters because the ink inside them is fluorescent. Some of them to varying degrees, right? So we see blue light, we see our blue highlighter. Our blue highlighter isn't really doing much. But our other colors will see brightly fluoresce and you can make your own kind of art with just highlighters. Um, and so we tried out in our experiment a few different colors. You can see it says happy holidays, but our blue, we can't read it as well. All the other colors are working though, so you see them nice and bright. And it's the same principle, same, we have a molecule within the highlighters that are fluorescent, they're absorbing the light, they are um, releasing the light or emitting the light at a wavelength that makes it very, very bright. So as Jeff was saying, your colors are brighter, your whites are brighter, and that's all because of this effect with the absorbance of the UV light. Great. Okay. And another way that you might encounter fluorescence in everyday life is with tonic water. So this is a bottle of tonic water I just picked up at the grocery store, uh, and it contains a compound called quinine, which uh, is a tonic for malaria. Okay, if you ever get malaria, don't try to fix it by taking, by drinking tons of tonic water. There's nowhere near enough in here. Okay, but um, for some reason, some people actually like the flavor. I think it's disgusting. But once again, the things I do for science. Just to prove that I haven't doctored this in some way. Oops. Um, now, one quick question. Um, how are my teeth? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, if you ever wind up out at a, uh, a fine drinking establishment, um, and when you're old enough, order a gin and tonic and find a black light, your drink will glow. Or you can go to Rock and Bowl now, and your clothes will glow. Ah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, ah, yeah. All right. So, do you want to talk about this one? Or you want me to talk about it? It doesn't matter. Okay. You have the lasers. I'll stand here. Okay. All right. This is the part of the show where I get to zap Aaron. Um, oh. Surprise! Things glow. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so now we're gonna show you a slightly different property other than fluorescence. We're gonna talk about phosphorescence. So in fluorescence, we shine light on something and then the light is immediately emitted right afterwards. So there's no delay, okay? 
if there's a delay and a lag between the excitation, so light, shining light on it, and then the light being emitted back, that's a different process. That's phosphorescence. Okay, so what we have here is some Bristol board that's been uh, painted with glow-in-the-dark paint. And, oh, this doesn't work. If you think about most glow-in-the-dark stuff, most phosphorescent stuff, what color is it? Green. Green, yeah. Okay, so in order to get it to light up, we have to give it more energy than green light. So order of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, right? So violet is the high energy end. Red is the low energy end. So if we shine a red light on this, it's not enough energy to excite the material to give us green light back. If we even shine green light on there, still nothing. How about purple? Really, I'm not nervous. <laughs> <laughs> to our hearts. <laughs> okay, so that's phosphorescence. Now, believe it or not, we now have some phosphorescent materials where the uh, lag can be up to hours. Okay. Moving on. Oh, okay, yeah. It's time for a clock reaction. Okay, if you've ever seen CSI or uh, some other shows uh, involving forensics, they might do uh, use luminol to uh, detect traces of blood. We're going to do a similar reaction here uh, where we're, we're using luminol, but instead of detecting traces of blood, we're going to use hydrogen peroxide because, um, frankly, I don't want to bleed for this show. <laughs> uh, that's where you draw the line. Yeah, okay. that's where I draw the line. I'll <laughs> eat stuff, but I'm not doing blood donation. Um, so. How long these take to turn on depends on the concentration of the materials that we've put in here. So one, two, three. This, by the way, is the same reaction as in glow sticks. You can change the color by putting in a dye. And here comes the last one. There we go. Hey. <laughs> So that's chemiluminescence, and that's also the same sort of phenomenon that um, organisms that live in dark environments will use uh, to communicate with each other, right? They'll, uh, or attract prey, right? So fireflies, things that live in the deep ocean um, use this, that process as well. Okay, now it's time for the hottest reaction of the show. It's also very bright, so if you have light sensitivity, just so you know. Yeah. How hot is this? About 2,500 degrees. Well, it's at room temperature right now. <laughs> okay. See? Okay. But at about 2,500 degrees, iron melts. So what we have in here is a pile of rust and aluminum powder. And you might think, rust is pretty stable stuff. Okay, but it turns out oxygen really actually prefers to be bonded to aluminum rather than iron. It's a much stronger bond. So if we give this enough of a kick, it will actually start to trade the oxygens from the iron to the aluminum and release enough energy to melt the iron. Okay, and it will do this in, fra in a fraction of a second. And so keep your eye on the bottom of this flower pot here. Now the kick I'm going to give it to get started is a party sparkler. And one, two, three. Now who brought the marshmallows? That's molten iron in there. Let's see if I can. It starts to harden, but it'll take a long time yeah. before we can clean it up. Yeah, it's starting to flow there a bit. You can see that. 
Can I do that again? I could if you give me about 20 minutes. There it goes. You can see it. It's actually flowing like molten lava. So yeah, that'll take us probably uh, probably about an hour before that gets cool enough that we can actually move it and put it away. Okay, and our last one. Um, and I need the torch. Back to food. Okay, who likes M&Ms? Okay, yeah. Um, so earlier I mentioned that nuts contain a lot of oil, right? And there's a lot of energy in that oil. What we're going to do is we're going to digest an M&M the same way our body would take a couple hours to do it. We're going to do it in about 20 seconds. Okay, so, but instead of using oxygen from air, we're going to use an oxidizing agent that I've put in the tube here. Um, that's potassium chlorate. I just need to actually liquefy it uh, before we, we can run the reaction. Now, the M&M that I'm going to put in there, one peanut M&M contains about 13 calories. Okay, now, like, okay, fine, 13 calories, whatever. You know, it, it's hard to really picture for yourself, what does that mean? Like, what does that much energy actually look like? You're about to find out. Okay. So, we just got to liquefy this. All right, and this is our last demonstration. So, at this point, we want to thank everybody who's helped out with the show. Uh, Jamie and Jared and Larry, Moira our, uh, and Lisa, all our technical uh, staff, uh, Daniel, one of our technicians who helped uh, prepare uh, for this, Sarah, who's done a whole bunch of stuff, including helping with the lights and guiding the tour today, um, and more people than I can think of, uh, uh, Let's Talk Science, um, who has uh, uh, helped promote the show, um, and I think this is now ready to go. So. One peanut M&M, 13 calories. So right now that's digesting the chocolate. Um, that's about 700 degrees. And now it's gonna start going on the peanut. And the temperature is about 1,000 when it does that. And by the way, we only burnt about half of it. So, uh, I'd like you to remember this demonstration the next time you sit down and eat an entire bag. <laughs> or you could think of it like you have a lot of energy, which yes. is great. Yeah. Excellent. So that's our show, thank you very much. <laughs>